Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Rachel Kleinfeld. She is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She's a leading expert on how democracies can improve with, with a particular focus on countries facing poor leadership, polarized populations, violence and corruption. She advises governments, philanthropists and activists on how democracies make major social change. She's also the author of three books, the most recent one and the one we're going to discuss today uh, being a savage order how the world's deadliest countries can forge a path to security. And I will leave the rest of the introduction in the description box of the video because today, unfortunately, we have to rush a little bit because uh, we, have a, we have a time constraint here. So Dr. Kleinfeld, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Thrilled to be here, Ricardo. Okay, great. So let me just ask you before we start getting into more specific details of your book, what is the basic premise of a savage order? Well, the punchline, if one can use that word for a book about violence, is that most people think of violence as happening during wartime. In the modern era, in the 21st century, that's not true. The vast majority of violence, about 82% of all violent deaths, happens outside of war. And most of it happens in middle-income democracies uh, like Brazil, not in Syria. Uh, the secondary punchline is the reason for that, and that's the bulk of the book. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, let me just ask you this right away. So basically, in your book, you are not arguing against the data presented by people like, for example, Steven Pinker, right? It is uh, the case that most of uh, violence and the different types of violence that we have around the world have been in decline for at least the past several decades and also in terms of war, right? That's right. So the good news is violence of every type has fallen since the Middle Ages, really since hunter-gatherer times, as, as Steven Pinker has pointed out. Mm -hmm. So you can see, you know, it's not a steady line down. There's ups and downs. Right now we're in a little bit of an up from war, but nothing like the mid-20th century. And so if you look at a multi-century uh, view or if you just look at the end of the Cold War to now, violence of every type is down. So that's the good news. We're dealing with kind of a last mile problem. But that last mile is pretty sticky, like it often is in, in such problems, because the violence that we're left with is not violence happening between countries um, led by leaders who are fighting over territory or what have you. It's often uh, violence happening within middle-income democracies that looks a lot like crime. Um, but I, as I argue in the book, that's not the whole story. Mm -hmm. So, but I guess there's only a small issue there, and I guess that you explore that in the book, that has to do with the fact that when it comes to crimes perpetrated by states, then we have some problems in, in counting those cases, right? Because there are some forms of more or less subtle violence that states commit, particularly against their citizens, for example, that sometimes we don't take too seriously or other times as well it is the case that we don't have good enough data on that right? that's right so the book starts with a big caveat which is that the data in this area is horrible really horrible and so i look for patterns i look for a lot of ways to bolster the numbers so that we're not just relying on the numbers the reason for that is multifold first in the mid 1600s the world um, had just fought the Thirty Years' War. It was one of the bloodiest wars. It killed vast majority of um, a, a lot of German citizens, a lot of European citizens, and it was so awful that the nations of the world basically said, look, we're not going to interfere in the national order of states. We're going to let rulers decide what, the, what they're going to do within their borders in order to keep the peace. And up until today, that is basically the idea that international relations has operated on, that what happens within borders, we don't count as seriously as we count internationally. So we look seriously at war deaths. We look seriously at what one country does to another country. But what happens, you know, crime, that's a domestic matter. We don't interfere. 
The problem is that most wars today are happening within borders. The vast majority of wars are civil wars. But also the vast majority of violent deaths are happening within borders. And while, as you said, it might look like crime, when you start unpacking it, you start to see that the state often has a role in that violence. And the state might be perpetrating it directly through imprisonment, for instance, uh, the prison um, complexes in China, but also in the United States. Um, or it might be doing it indirectly by partnering with groups that look non-governmental, gangs, drug cartels, um, but in fact are being allowed to operate because of the state. And so the, the fact that we can't count the violence internally becomes a real problem for fighting it nowadays. Mm -hmm. Also because it might also happen sometimes that, particularly in more totalitarian states, that they also try to hide what they're doing and I mean unless someone gets in there and really tries to uh, evaluate what happened there and tries to come up with some data about it and it involves perhaps most of the time a little bit of speculation we won't ever have direct access to the numbers and the people that were affected there that's right. I mean, we think that Russia is undercounting its violent deaths by maybe a third. Um, China, we have really very little idea what's going on within their prison complex, North Korea. But it's not only totalitarian states, although they might be the worst offenders. We think that Chicago police are cooking the books on the numbers of violent deaths, or at least the number of criminal deaths. Um, that's very common in a, in a lot of um, democratic countries where it doesn't serve them electorally to keep good numbers. It's very political. In Honduras, where the president, of course, is now accused of running a drug cartel, um, famously, a couple of years ago, he took the independent statistics office and brought it into the government so that uh, independent statistics on death weren't kept anymore. So this is a problem worldwide, really. Mm -hmm. Right. Perhaps in different ways, in different places and for different reasons, but right. it's basically a worldwide problem, right? So, um, I, I mean, in your book, you refer to several different types of violence. You refer, for example, to common and organized crime, one-sided violence like terrorism, and also war. So I'm not sure if in all of these cases, these types of violence are directly political. So, for example, in common and organized crime, maybe many times it isn't. But are there common threads that run through all of these different types of violence? So what I argue in the state is that, um, in the book, is that many people for many years have thought that the worst violence happens in weak states, in states that are simply too weak to patrol themselves. And states that are weak invite competitors, they invite rebellion, which is a, a kind of war, but they also invite crime and pillaging, their border areas are violent and so on. That had been the common way of thinking about the problem. And what I say is, that's not actually the case. Weak states are violent. Um, but they're also fairly easy to strengthen. If the only problem is that the state is weak, we actually know a lot about how you strengthen a state. It's not that difficult. The bigger problem is states that are complicit. And these are states that are either giving a pass to certain violent groups within their territory um, or working with them directly. Not all cases of violence fall into this category, what I call a savage order, the name of the book. Um, so I don't want to claim that all violence that way. There is criminal violence. and so. But um, there are a lot of countries that we call weak but are actually complicit. And that's what I wanted to zero in on and really focus on that problem. Mm -hmm. So in your, in your book, when you talk about weak states that aren't able to have a monopoly over violence, let's say, and to enforce law, for example, there are two ways that they could go down that route that is... Uh, maybe they are too weak to enforce order and other times they also uh, sort of join forces with some, uh, I, I mean, some, some of the time uh, politically oriented violent groups, let's say, and even other times uh, directly with uh, criminal groups to try to enforce a little bit of order in society through those violent means. Right? In the book I talk about the Wild West versus the US South after our own civil war. Mm 
And I contrast those two different kinds of violence. The Wild West really was wild. When you look at the statistics, it was oh, it, it was incredibly violent. The statistics are worse than Colombia at the height of its drug violence. But the violence of the Wild West lasted for a very short period of time. It was at its height in the 1880s and um, dropped really quickly by the by the early 1890s. So you really had a period from the 1860s to the 1880s where it was rising and then it dropped really fast as the state came in, as women came in and sort of diluted the testosterone levels of, of the wild western cities. Um, as people started to accept law enforcement as more legitimate in the Civil War, uh, receded in the background because you had a lot of Northern Union law enforcement men and a lot of Southern uh, cowboys and so on. As, as that faded, the state came in, it got better. So that's a weak state. Weak state, very violent. As the state comes in and forces order is seen as legitimate, things get better. The U.S. South was a very different story. The U.S. South, the violent peaked, violence peaked about 30 years after the Civil War. So that wasn't a weak state. The police had been rebuilt. The law enforcement had been rebuilt. Courts had been rebuilt. The problem in the South wasn't that the state was weak. It was that the state was colluding with non-state violent actors. In the case of the South, many Confederate politicians couldn't win legitimate elections once blacks were enfranchised. And so as white nationalist groups started up, and they weren't started by the state, they were started by regular people who had hatred in their hearts. As those white nationalist groups started up, politicians would basically say with a wink and a nod, hey, chase the blacks out of here, scare them away from voting, scare the Republicans away from voting, because back then, Many blacks were Republican because the um, party of Lincoln was the party that had freed them. Mm -hmm. So scare all those folks away from voting, and if we get power, you won't be punished. And so that was the deal. It was an implicit deal, but you'd often have law enforcement who are part of the Ku Klux Klan. You'd often have mayors and governors who are part of these white supremacist organizations. They didn't need to say it explicitly for everyone to know where their loyalties lay. And so... As white nationalism took off and scared voters away and it would spike before elections and so on, the state that came back in was a Confederate state. So they lost the war, but they won the peace. Mm -hmm. And after the 1890s, when they were able to kick out the federal government troops, they could enforce order um, through a kind of white nationalist supremacy in the 11 states of the South. And so what I argue is that the violence of the Wild West of a weak state and the violence of a complicit state is very different. And the solutions are very different because... The solution to the U.S. South was not to strengthen the state. People were pulling African-American defendants right out of jail in order to lynch them. The problem wasn't that the jails didn't exist. It was that the state didn't want to enforce laws that were being imposed upon it by a national government that it didn't see as legitimate. Mm -hmm. So it was also that sort of state of affairs that really pushed uh, through with racism uh, in the United States for a uh, hundred years or so more after the Civil War, right? Well, one thing you see in the United States is that the violence drops as Jim Crow laws kick in. So basically, as the Confederates regain power, it's easier to enforce order without violence. It's cheaper, it's less, uh, gets you in the papers less. So as they regained power, they were able to enforce a one-party state by passing laws that disenfranchised the blacks. As that happened, you see the violence drop very quickly, actually. The state comes back in control and retakes a, mon a monopoly on violence. Still allows a little white nationalist violence, but mostly reins it in because they'd figured out how to maintain power without it. And we see something quite similar, I argue, in many other democracies that look like they're overrun by gangs. They look like they're facing ethnic pogroms. They look like there's just hatred in the hearts of a lot of people against other people. And what can the poor, weak state do? But what I argue is that actually a lot of that has origins in, in the political order that's allowing those groups to run rampant, just as happened in the U.S. South. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us about what you call privilege violence in your book? I, I, I'm not sure if uh, what you described there corresponds in any way to that uh, term that you use, but could you tell us about it? That's right. So what I argue is that what's happening in the U.S. South is a form of privilege violence. It happened in the U.S. South. One could argue whether it's happening now. And it's happening in many other countries. And what it looks like, it's a pattern. And what it looks like is this. The, um, in a democracy that has fairly weak institutions, a small group of power want to maintain power. Mm 
and they want to maintain inordinate privilege. These are often highly unequal states. Um, almost by definition, this kind of violence happens in highly unequal countries. And so losing power is a big deal. You might get um, killed by the opposition party. You might get jailed for many, many years for corruption or what have you. Um, you'll certainly lose a huge amount of money and become much, much poorer. So in highly unequal, highly polarized democracies, a small group of people want to maintain power, but they're worried that they can't win legitimate elections. So what can they do? They can try to rig elections, but they might get caught or they might fail. They can also turn to violent groups to help them um, win the election. Maybe they ask gangs to help them quell the opposition vote or get out the vote for their side, force people to vote for their side. Maybe drug cartels will fund their campaign so that they have a lot of money to buy advertising and to um, put money in people's pockets in more patronage-based systems. Maybe mafias are doing that. For one reason or another, they're turning to violent groups for help. And the implicit deal is, you help me win power, I'll let you do your crime, um, have your pogroms, do the things that you want to do, and I won't, I won't arrest you for that. How do you achieve that if you have a legitimate police force? You can't. The police will arrest people who break the laws. So you have to politicize the police force. So the second step is that your police and sometimes your military institutions, but more your police um, and your courts become politicized. Politicians make their budgets small and make them um, subject to whims of the politicians. They appoint people to high positions that are politically loyal, maybe not very competent. They make sure that um, subordinates who enforce the law without reference to political favors get fired or get moved to the hinterlands where their lives are not very nice. Um, so they politicize these forces and they politicize the courts so that they can control and manipulate them. Well, pretty soon, good lawyers decide not to become judges. They become things that, that are better lives, less political manipulation, more money. Good people who might otherwise become police join the military or find other jobs. And what you're left with is a core of people who need those jobs because maybe they can't get any other job and um, w are willing to be that politicized. And among police particularly, what you often start seeing is brutality. You start seeing bad apples who realize that they aren't going to be arrested they aren't going to be punished by the politicians in any way, shape, or form, and they start forming gangs and violent groups of their own. It often starts by um, what's often called kind of rough justice. They'll, uh, a police group will start extorting drug dealers, or they'll start, you know, they'll kill a notorious thug who they think will get let off by a corrupt court. But over time, as the impunity goes, they just become criminals themselves. And so you become... Um, a force in which your courts become corrupt and your police become deeply corrupt and violent. That violence tends to fall on the poor and the more marginalized in every country in the world. The, when the violence hits the middle class, there's an outcry, people get upset, the media attention turns to it. So they tend to get away with it in poorer neighborhoods. And then what do the poor do? Well, the middle class has bought private security by this time, but the poor don't have that option. And so what you tend to see in poor neighborhoods is gangs coming in and saying that they'll protect people from the criminals and also from the state, from the police. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty attractive offer. And often other gangs are fighting. And so you want your gang to fight the other gangs. Mm -hmm. So criminals start getting legitimacy within these countries. And then the last stage of privilege violence happens when Violence is so ubiquitous, it's become so normalized within society that regular people start turning to violence. So you start seeing um, neighbors extorting other neighbors and blaming it on the gangs. You'll start seeing um, people hiring hitmen to kill their boss or to kill a landlord to whom they owe rent. Because it's cheap, the price of violence has gone down. And because it's pretty easy and there's so much violence that you're not going to get caught. Impunity is very high. And so what you see is this cascade of violence that starts with the state, goes into the state police forces, and then falls to regular normal people. And by that point, the middle class starts saying, there's violence everywhere, help us, we need more law and order. And they reinforce the very cycle that started by electing the politicians who are willing to work with violent groups and are willing to allow their security forces to be violent in order to protect the middle class. So it's kind of a self-licking ice cream cone. It starts uh, perpetuating itself, you know. Mm -hmm. So all of this process that you described where violence basically trickles down and spreads through society is what you call in the book the, the civilizing process, correct? 
That's right. And I use that in a very specific manner. That's Steven Pinker uses that term. The violentologists use that term. It doesn't mean any particular culture is decivilized. It can happen in any culture where the government is, it turns absent and violent itself and people start becoming habituated to violence in this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you were talking, one of the examples that immediately popped up in my mind, uh, and I'm not sure if it's really a very good illustrative example of it, but I guess it is, is some of the mafias that operate in Italy, like, for example, the Camorra in Naples, because, I mean, there's also other mafias like the Cosa Nostra that operate more in Rome and places like that, but... Uh, at le and I don't know how's the situation now, but at least until very recently, it seems that the Camorra basically had all power at all levels of society in Naples, right? That's right. Actually, the book contrasts the fight against the mafia in Sicily, the Cosa Nostra, against the fight in Naples, against the Camorra. And mm -hmm. so in the, the second half of the book where I talk about the solutions to this kind of violence and how society kind of has to pull itself together to fight it, I talk about why that happened in Sicily, why society organized itself against the Cosa Nostra and forced the state to get rid of it. Um, not entirely, but to turn it into kind of a, a more normal criminal phenomena where it didn't have these deep links to politicians. Whereas in Naples, as you point out, the the city council, I don't remember the exact number now, but it's been dissolved dozens and dozens of times because each time the Camorra gets its tentacles throughout the city council and then the national government dissolves it and then the same thing happens. The demand for the Camorra is very strong. And people discount that. People who live in safe places think, well, of course, regular individuals must hate the violent criminals and must want a legitimate state. But when you get into these places, the state doesn't look a lot more legitimate than the criminals often. The state might have fused with the criminals, as with the Camorra, where um, there's a sense that so many of the politicians are on the payroll of the Camorra that where one starts and the other leaves off is hard to tell. And then these violent groups also gain support among the middle class. They distribute jobs, uh, construction jobs, uh, bank jobs. They often provide capital for people who have small enterprises and can't get regular bank loans. And so they become kind of a necessary part of business life and of social life that for the middle class who don't tend to get hit by the violence seems better than the state or at least linked to the state, kind of similar to the state. The poor who are getting hit by the violence might have a very different idea, but they might also need the gangs to protect them against other gangs. The Camorra is notoriously um, fractured, and so one one family might be protecting one neighborhood, another family protecting another, uh, with protection in quotation marks, since a lot of people get killed in the fights between such groups. Mm -hmm. And I mean, all of those processes we've also seen occurring, for example, uh, in places like Colombia and with people like, for example, Pablo Escobar and people that controlled basically the flux of drugs there. Because I, I mean, at a certain point, even if they are not if they don't get directly into the political system, I mean, they amass so much uh, economic power that even if it is indirectly, they start having uh, a, a big role to play in their societies. That's exactly right. The book chronicles the, the travails of Colombia and how by the early 90s, the drug forces were so significant that they made up a significant portion of the GDP in the country. Um, and certainly in cities like Cali, the construction boom and so on, Everyone knows that what's behind that is the drug money. The drug cartel, Kali cartel, bought a bank and distributed bank uh, boardship member membership to leading members of society. And so uh, they also ran a pharmacy chain. They ran legitimate businesses. They had a lot of money. So it was easy for people who were part of their country club, who were part of the bank, to say, oh, those are CEOs of a pharmacy chain, and they've made a lot of money that way, and now they're helping the city and to kind of turn a blind eye to accusations that they were also running the Kali cartel um, because it was helping their city so much. And so the economic ties that these violent actors start bringing to the upper crust of society become quite significant. Mm -hmm.
So uh, let me ask you this now. Uh, are there situations, and I guess there are, where it makes sense and you think it might be legitimate for at least temporarily governments um, uh, for them to make some sort of dirty deals and to ally themselves temporarily with those kinds of more, um, let's say, violent criminal groups? So getting out of this violence is the topic of the whole second half of the book. Mm -hmm. And I frankly, you know, I'm an old human rights campaigner. I didn't like what I found empirically, but I'm also a researcher. And so I had to report on what I found. And what I found was this. The, in countries that are complicit, where the violent groups have forged ties with the state, mm -hmm. the state itself has become weakened by that point. It, it isn't that a weak state led to the violence. It's that a deliberately weakened state was causing violence. And because of the deliberate weakening, the state doesn't have a lot of power to get rid of those violent groups. They have completely infiltrated the security forces often. So in Colombia, for instance, the United States would provide intelligence to try to help the Colombians fight Escobar's cartel. The intelligence would leak every single time and Escobar would move. And who was leaking it? Everybody was leaking it. There were so many ties through. So the state couldn't do anything. In um, Italy, in Palermo, in Sicily, the mayor of Sicily who was trying to fight the mafia said, look, I don't even trust my secretary. I'm pretty sure that anything I say to my secretary is going to get its way back to the mafia. So in a deliberately weakened state, the state doesn't have a lot of leverage. There's, a, there's not that much it can do. And so to do is give the violent groups a reason to step down. And usually those are negotiated deals that look pretty dirty. And so in the academic literature, these are called political settlements or elite settlements. I call them dirty deals because I say, look, let's call them what they are. What they are is a deal with violent groups that says, you step down your violence, give up your violence, and we will not prosecute you. We'll give you some impunity. We might let you keep some of the money or all of the money that you made through your uh, violent criminal activities. Um, we might even give you a portion of the state. So when these uh, violent groups take a political form, in the book I talk about how the political and criminal forms are pretty uh, hard to distinguish on the ground, actually. The Taliban is a violent rebel group, but it's also running drugs and making a lot of money from opium. You see that kind of thing in all these countries. But in when it's a rebel movement that's classified as political, sometimes they'll ask for ministries. And so... Uh, you see the Maoists in Nepal get some a lot of their men into the Ministry of Forests where they can make a lot of revenue from the government. So one way or another, these criminal groups are given a choice. And in the best of these deals, they're said, they're told, put down your violence, you'll get a cut of the state. But the state then tries very quickly to strengthen itself and become more legitimate and unravel the deals. So... Um, uh, they and it could be different parts of the state. So in Colombia, uh, President Uribe gave a very sweetheart deal to the paramilitary groups, uh, just a, a peace agreement that really gave them all the power. But then the the courts said, no, no, you can't do that, and they they made it more difficult. But after a lot of the paramilitaries had stepped down, so when this works, you make a deal, but then you have to very quickly strengthen the state, rebuild legitimacy, and unravel the very deal that you just made. That's a hard thing to do. And so often what happens is you make the deal and then the state becomes more illegitimate because you've got criminals who are now a part of the state. The criminals further fuse with the state and you're back to the beginning. So it's kind of a shoots and ladders. The first step out is a dirty deal, but it only works if you immediately, if you really intend to create a, a stronger, less violent state and if you immediately start building legitimacy. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if it makes sense to try to connect these two different kinds of literature, but you you must know that Eric Eshenoff and others have studied uh, what happens after people in different societies went through different kinds of revolution, and they compared basically the more violent ones with the more pacific ones. And I, I, I mean, and I'm referring to that because in that literature they concluded that basically basically uh, the more pacific revolutions were best in the were better in the long run because basically they led to 
more uh, democratic and more inclusive, let's say, society. So, but uh, so uh, I'm I'm basically referring to this because I wanted to ask you if, when you talk about weakened states, you are you are also referring to the fact that people, uh, at a certain point, no longer trust their own society and so it's also difficult for them to mobilize uh, and to strengthen the state basically um all the states i look at are highly violent so the option of a pacific revolution isn't an option these are places that are already very violent and they're already very polarized it's the polarization in society that lets the violence continue in a normal society where regular people don't hate one another. If violence begins, people come together and they say, let's solve this problem and we'll pass some laws or what have you to, to deal with it. So New Zealand, after the big uh, shooting at Christ Church, they immediately pass gun control laws, they come together as a society. A healthy society does that. In the book I talk about Ghana and why Ghana didn't become violent, even though Nigeria, which looks very similar, did. Ghana had a poor Muslim North, a richer Christian South, it had um, a government that basically fell apart altogether in the 70s. People were eating grass. There was no um, functional government. And yet you didn't have a lot of violence because it was a healthy society. There were still all the gatekeepers of society, chiefs and parents and uh, uh, extended family and all, all of the things that keep people from becoming violent. You get this kind of violence in highly polarized societies where people don't trust each other, they're angry with each other, and they're fighting. And because of, of that anger, they can't solve their problems. So, um, you know, the United States is a good example of this, although hardly the only one. But when you have violence, some people say the solution is that the state is unjust and you need to get rid of the state. In Colombia, you had some people responding to violence by saying, let's join the FARC, let's join the ELN, let's join guerrilla movements, because the democracy is so failed, it's so unfair, it's so unjust that the only way to have a real democracy is through violence. And then you had the other side saying, look at all these guerrilla movements that are killing people in the countryside, that are forcing people, stealing children, um, forcing people into lives of violence. We better support right-wing paramilitary groups to protect ourselves. And so you have a society that just can't agree on the problem. And so they, they become more and more violent. That's the kind of societies I'm talking about. And so a Pacific option just isn't an option for them. Mm -hmm. So is it possible to go from dirty deals or a situation where the government is forced to make these sort of deals with more violent criminal groups to try to, uh, I mean, have some control of some kind over society to uh, and move from that state to a legitimate government or a situation where the state is able to remove those sorts of connections? Absolutely, it is. And I think that's the hopeful part of the book, is that these situations look really bad, and yet over and over again, in all the cases I chronicle, people found a way out. That way out starts not with the dirty deals, it starts with citizens coming together. It starts with citizens saying, you know what, we are fed up of this violence and what's happening isn't working. And I talk about why that happens, that in highly polarized societies, you tend to need a social movement to give a different story to people, to say, look, the problem isn't the guerrillas or the paramilitaries. The problem is the structure of your government is so broken. And can you agree on a new constitution in the case of Colombia or um, in the case of Palermo in Sicily? Uh, the mafia just started to kill so indiscriminately that people who had supported the Christian Democratic Party, even though it had mafia ties against the Communist Party in Sicily, said, you know what, we need a new class of politicians. We need people who uh, who are breaking out of this binary and they came out on the streets and they argued uh, you know, for something different. So it starts with a social movement generally that gives people a new way of framing what's happening to them. They come out on the streets, they demand a new politician. That new politician has to make the dirty deals because they inherit such a weak state. But they can't stop there. As I said before, they also have to start making the state legitimate making sure that there's less corruption or no corruption, and making it much more inclusive, reaching out to the people who had previously not gotten decent policing, had just gotten brutality or the absence of the state, and start bringing them in, offering them services from the state. As those things happen, society starts to heal. 
and the the uh, self reinforcing cycle of violence becomes a self reinforcing cycle of social trust. Whereas people start trusting one another more, seeing one another as parts of a fellow similar citizenship that is trying to solve their own problems, they start looking out for each other. And then the police have fewer crimes to solve because one thing we know about policing is that it's really the last gasp of the state. It's not the first. It, you stop most crime by not committing it. You stop most crime by people telling their kids don't commit crime, by people being on the streets and noticing crime and deterring it just by being out and around. So as societies become more healthy, they're able to quell more crime within them. And then it becomes just the few bad apples, the sort of pathological individuals. And regular people who trust the state are able to turn those people in instead of being afraid to call the police because they think the police are in cahoots with the criminals. And if they call the police, they'll soon get a knock on their door from the criminals um, with a threat to not be in touch with the state or worse. So you start getting, as the state proves itself to be more legitimate, you start getting a positive cycle in which the state and society together kind of pass the ball back and forth and start to re-legitimize. Mm -hmm. So in this, let's say, re-civilizing process, why is it so important for us to try to target and mobilize the middle class? So most people, when they're looking at violence, look at the people who are violent and they focus on how do you fight them? Or they look at the people who are victims of violence and they say, how do we help them? And what I found was that uh, that's not the fulcrum of change in these countries, that even in countries that have just a small middle class, and by middle class, um, I mean something a little different than purely money. It's basically about who has voice in society and who has some time to mobilize and become part of a social movement. Um, and so, you know, as the mother of two very young children, I'm middle class, but I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> you, need, you need enough time to get out on the street or to write people or, you know, to, to make some change. Um, you also need to be part of the dominant society because in these societies which have a highly marginalized group of people, those people who are very marginalized have trouble, even if they are middle class, being heard, right? So the experience of African Americans under Jim Crow with lynching was that they could speak out and white society just didn't care very much. And so part of this is about the economics of being middle class, but it's really about who has voice as a part of mainstream society to make change. And that group matters because that's the group that, that turns the politics. That's the group that um, the politicians start saying, well, if they're turning, I'd better change my tune. So again, I use the civil rights example in, in the book, and I'll use it here, that African Americans had been complaining about lynching and violence for decades and decades. The NAACP had run big campaigns against it in the 30s. Um, there'd been a perpetual push to have a law against it. And the politicians wouldn't pass the law because they were afraid of losing the Democratic South, the, the Southern states that they depended on for votes. So it was only when the African American Civil Rights Movement teamed up with whites in the North, students, a lot of them, and that movement fused. And then suddenly the politicians realized they were going to lose the North if they kept sticking with the segregationists. And that was the calculation that made President Johnson who was a very political animal and had been no friend of civil rights as a senator. He voted against every single civil rights bill. But seeing that his choice was lose the South or lose the North because the movement of African Americans in the South had fused with the movement of the dominant mainstream society in the North, that made him change his political calculus. And so that's what you see in these countries, that the poor marginalized people can be pushing and pushing for change but their voices are not affecting the politicians um, for various reasons, at different, different in different countries. It's when people who are part of the politicians' social circles, their kids, their neighbors, that w when those people start saying, wait, we've got to change, that, that wakes the politicians up because they fear they'll lose the power. If they're sort of damned if they do, damned if they don't, and they need, they need to make change. Mm -hmm. So we're basically talking here about what we could call the majority in society, right? Not necessarily the numerical majority, but basically the, um, the group of people, let's say, that has the most influence in, in that given society. Yeah, it's the people who have influence rather than the numerical majority. Because in a lot of these places, the poor are the majority and they vote. Um, but they're easily bought off. 
by some of the violent groups. In a lot of countries, uh, the game is, can your group be more violent than the other group so that you get more of the spoils? And so even if the poor are the majority voters, they might be reinforcing the system because they don't think they can change it. All they think is, if I can get my group on top, then I'll be protected from the other groups. So it's really who has voice and who, who has the voice to change the system. And I call it the middle class because it's a shorthand for that. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, could you tell us specifically about the Georgia case and particularly how they fought against corruption? Because I guess from what I read that uh, they adopted some policies that might be a bit controversial or if not controversial, at least there aren't a lot of people in other countries that are willing to do the same sorts of things that they did there to uh, decrease, let's say, corruption. Yeah, so Georgia um, is one of the case studies in the book, and it's a it's a great case study for people who think that corruption is a cultural problem, that some cultures mm -hmm. are just prone to corruption because of X or Y. You know, it's a kind of a racist argument often. Um, and what Georgia showed was, look, corruption is institutional. Basically, if you have a system that's corrupt, then what are your choices as a normal person? If, say, universities are corrupt, as they were in, in Georgia, if you wanted to get your kid into a good university, you had to pay sometimes twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to get your kid into a medical program or international relations. Well, you cannot pay, and then your kid is disadvantaged against everyone else and doesn't get into university. Or you can pay, and your kid deserves to be in university, maybe. Maybe they get good grades, but they're not going to get in unless you pay. So. What the corruption, and same with things like a doctor, if your doctors are corrupt, what are you going to do? You're sick, you don't pay, you don't get a doctor's appointment, you pay, you do get a doctor's appointment. So if you have the money, you're going to pay. So what the corruption does is it makes everyone complicit, whether they like it or not. And it makes everyone sort of a part of the system, because even if they don't want to be corrupt, they can't function without being corrupt. It's even more dangerous for police. If in a very corrupt police force, if you're the honest cop, you might get killed by your fellow cops. Um, they don't want an honest policeman to turn them in. Um, much easier to corrupt everyone. And because police sense that, they might kind of go along, get along, they don't like it, but then after a while, they've been doing it six, seven, eight years, it becomes second nature, and then why not take a little extra? You know, they, they need money at home and everyone else is doing it and no one's gonna get caught. What are they doing pretending to be so honest when um, nothing is honest and no one is honest, right? So in these systems, there's a tipping point and the corruption becomes systemic, but everybody um, or most mainstream people don't like it. They just have to be part of it. That can change. So it's not a culture of corruption that's got to do with who you are. It's a system of corruption. And the way to change a system like that is through a big bang. So what Georgia did when they had a new leader come into town was basically a huge, they fired the entire traffic police force because they said, look, we're better off with no police than with poorly paid, corrupt police. Um, they would do the same with customs and with other places where there was a lot of corruption, mass firings and then rehirings. And the rehirings would have zero tolerance. So you'd get fired if you stole $1 or $10 or $100, you know, same same thing. And in customs where they had particular problems, as most countries do, they said uh, it was a kind of a group enforcement. So if someone on your shift was corrupt, even if it wasn't you, you would be fired. So a huge incentive in a country that didn't have a lot of jobs. This was a country that was uh, really having trouble creating a functional economy after all of its violence. You were going to lose your job too, so you'd better tell on your fellow squadrons that kind of broke the thin blue line of silence that you get in a lot of these systems. So what you had was very quickly um, a change from a, a system of corruption to a system of non-corruption. Um, and it worked very well. Now in Georgia, uh, a lot of stories stop there and they just say, look, you overcame the corruption and that's great. But what happened next is also part of the book because as the state became overly strong and sort of became entranced with, with its own PR, it, it overreached and it started to um, use tax law and so on in a way of catching people who were originally corrupt. So it would pull in business people in the middle of the night and say, you made all your money through corruption, you're going to pay X amount in taxes to the state. And everyone cheered, you know, because this was catching the fat cats who had made all this money in the wartime economy and the violent economy, and they deserved to be caught. And finally, someone was bringing them to justice. 
But over time, that kind of system of justice without law allowed the state to overreach. And that's what you started seeing in Georgia and in many of the cases where uh, Uribe in Colombia and, and so on start to move from forces to fight violence to forces of state violence. And so the book talks about what do you do as the state itself becomes stronger, but also begins to use violence against its political opponents. Or And, and by violence, sometimes it's uh, death, but sometimes it's imprisonment, the kinds of tools the state has. Mm -hmm. You know, that's very interesting, all of the things that you've just said, and it's particularly relevant to Portugal because uh, we are very high indeed in the global corruption index, I guess. Uh, and uh, I guess that's the name of it. Uh, and, I, and it's interesting because people here and I guess in other countries talk a lot about, oh, uh, uh, it's about the culture, people are lazy, people are subservient to the political powers or to their superiors at work or whatever. And I, I mean, at the end of the day, maybe that's not the case. Um. Cultures are different. I'm not saying culture doesn't exist, you know, yeah, but sure. um, but what I'm saying is that with corruption, once it's systemic, once it hits a tipping point, it's pretty hard not to be not to do it. Um, and to take the to change the system requires um, not just treating corruption as a few bad apples here and there, kick out that politician, get rid of that police chief. It's about changing a whole system of how things get done in society, right? So. If you're a business and to get your business license, you can either wait for three years or you can pay a little corruption and get your license in two weeks, you would just be crazy not to pay the license. You need to change a whole system of how you get things done so that people can be honest and don't look like patsies when they're honest. When I Before I started this research, when um, I was doing other research in Indonesia 20 years ago almost, and... Uh, there was a judge who had decided to be honest. And the only way to be honest on a judge's salary in that part of Indonesia was to live very far out of Jakarta because you couldn't live in Jakarta on a judge's salary. He couldn't buy nice suits. He couldn't have a car. It, the judges just weren't paid enough. And so he dressed kind of shabbily. He had a shabby briefcase. He lived in the outskirts of town. And instead of seeing him as this shining light for anti-corruption reform, People just saw him as kind of kooky and a little bit pathetic. You know, his life was not good. And everybody everybody else was doing it, so why not do it? So you have to change that whole system so that someone who is uh, honest isn't seen as pathetic, but is seen as honorable. And that, that requires change from the top in a really systemic way. Mm -hmm. But again, you've already alluded to this several times during the interview, when you say that maybe culture is not that important, and you also said that, for example, uh, sometimes when we think that culture is the cause, we might very easily get a bit raced, racist or xenophobic about things. I, I mean, what exactly do, do you mean by that? Sure, it's a great question. Billy, who was the um, ambassador of Georgia to America at one point. Uh, he was, he's this huge man. He looks like a bear. He's this just gigantic person with huge hands. And I remember he leaned over his desk and I felt like he was going to eat me. I mean, he's just this big guy. And he said, look, the idea of culture of co corruption as cultural is just bullshit. It's like the Japanese watermelons. And I said, what? The Japanese watermelons? What are you talking about? And what he was talking about was that in Japan, they grow watermelons, or they grew, I don't know if they still do, they grew watermelons in boxes so that they would be square. And the idea of a square watermelon was kind of cool, and people would give it as gifts to people, and they were very expensive, and people wanted square watermelons. The watermelons weren't square because of the, the culture of watermelons. The watermelons were square because they were grown in square boxes. And they were grown in square boxes because the Japanese liked the square boxes. So there is a cultural reason. Um, but... Ultimately, what, what Tamori was saying is it's the institutions that shape the culture. So in the book I talk about America, a lot of people say America has a culture of violence, that we're a very violent people. Um, some people trace it back to Scotch-Irish heritage and uh, our frontier nature and all, all sorts of things like that. I grew up in Fairbanks, Alaska, which is very much on the frontier. Everybody had guns. We had guns in my house. It um, certainly was a violent culture. But 
what I argue in the book is that that violence is allowed to manifest itself in different ways, depending on the institutions, depending on the, the shape of that box that you're growing the watermelon in. So you could have a lot of people who like to own guns and are quick to fight. But if the state cracks down so that if you kill someone, you're going to jail right away, um, you will find that the violence takes the form of hunting, that the violence takes the form of um, video games, you know, that, that those outlets might, there might be some cultural reason for that, but it's not going to take the form of mass violence in the society if the government institutions enforce rules in a certain way. And we can see that not just in Georgia, but for instance, in countries um, in America and different states that have stand your ground laws that basically uh, make it easier to kill someone and claim self-defense. You see violence, uh, violent deaths shoot up, um, same place, everything else held constant. And so the the structure of the state, how the state enforces the rules, has a lot to do with how the culture manifests itself, whether those watermelon are circular or square, as it were. And so that's my argument. It's not that culture doesn't exist. It's that in the case of violence, particularly, places are violent or not violent, depending on how the state enforces the rules. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're almost reaching our time limit. So let me just ask you one last question that also oh. has to do with that last one. Uh, so, I mean, all of these things that we've been talking about, particularly the ones related to violence and now the question about culture and how we think about it, they might also give us important insights into some uh, political things that we have to deal nowadays in the current political environment, like, for example, uh, mass migration and things related to I I Islamic people and how we deal with them. Uh, and uh, I mean, and also how we think about multiculturalism and to what extent we are able to accommodate those people in our societies, because I mean, even even though, for example, right-wing people might exaggerate a bit the problem, p people in their respective societies still take it seriously. Right. So these are some really hard questions, and they get to the root of people who um, have fear and how that fear is framed by opportunistic politicians. Uh, it's hardwired in most people to fear the other. We actually have hormones that make us cleave to our own and fear the other. But how you define the other differs. And politicians can ramp up your definition of the other as a bigger, smaller group. So uh, in Italy, the what used to be called the um, Northern uh, League used to define the other as southern Italians. They wanted to secede from the south, and the other were those lazy southern Italians in Sicily who had the mafia and were bad, and, and we want to succeed. As they wanted to gain national power, they realized they couldn't other their own country. Uh, they weren't going to gain national power that way. So then they started to other the Muslims and immigrants and say, no, no, you southern Italians are part of us. We like you. You're not violent. You're not dirty. Mm -hmm. The people who are violent or dirty are the immigrants or the Muslims that are coming over, and they won power on that. So opportunistic politicians can take our natural tendency to create us versus them and um, change who the us and who the them are so that people have different reactions. And with violence, this is particularly difficult because what we, we know people's like psychology changes with violence. When people are scared, when they're in their fight or flight reaction, you're um, um, the sort of reptilian part of the brain, the oldest part of the brain, the least uh, thinking part of the brain goes into high gear and takes over. Um, you know, you've, if you've ever been afraid in a dream and you can't move, uh, that's kind of what's happening. You know, your, your body can't move, you're so scared. Or if you're um, fighting with your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend or what have you, and you say something that you know you're going to regret later because you're just so mad, you know, it, it's the same thing. Um, when you're extremely afraid, and what's happening even when you're fighting with your girlfriend or boyfriend or, hu or husband or wife is you're afraid that you're going to lose them. You're afraid of the attachment being lost. So, you say, so when people are afraid, their IQs drop. They become much less uh, able to discern um, information. They can't take in new information. All you can do is kind of regurgitate the information that's already there. Uh, things about our psychology that we're already used to, cognitive, cognitive uh, motivated reasoning where you search out information that you uh, think will confirm what you already believe. All those things kick into high gear. 
and it's so strong. I mean, there's there's really funny studies of this. So um, your your ability to see changes. So so you're looking for information that confirms what you already think, and you can't see information that's different. And there are psychologists who will show a picture of like a basketball game. And they'll have a person in a gorilla suit walk through the basketball game, just, you know, beating their chest. And they'll ask people afterward, um, did you see anything unusual? People who are um, primed to be a little afraid and who are doing cogn cognitive motivated reasoning won't see the gorilla that walked right in the middle of the, of the game. And I've done this test myself. It's stunning. You just don't see it. So what the politicians are doing in these cases is they're rising to power using violent groups to help them and using an othering of other people to help them create fear. That fear makes people dumber, I mean, literally reduces their IQ at that moment, and it makes people less discerning of information that might disprove things. So for instance, in America, where we have this fight going on, what the information actually shows is that immigrants, and including illegal immigrants, are less violent than native-born Americans, that on the whole they commit fewer crimes, fewer violent crimes, by quite a significant margin. But that's of course not what people feel, because when a native-born American commits a crime, it's not news. But if an illegal immigrant commits a crime, it's all over the papers and the politicians are making a big deal of it. And so what you hear is very different. It's the same in Europe and the same in many other countries. And so this, these natural tendencies are played on to create uh, fear but the problem is that what the politicians offer as a solution is exactly the opposite of a solution, and it helps them stay in power. So if you're running on a law and order platform and you say, I'm going to keep out those bad people who are violent, who are going to hurt you, and I'm going to bring back law and order, and one thing I'm going to do to bring back law and order is allow the police more latitude in using violence against these people. They can clear Roma camps. They can, uh, you know, arrest people with, with less reason. I'll let them beat up people and I'm not going to do anything. You hear that kind of law and order rhetoric. Well, that starts this whole cycle where the police become violent, poor people start looking to gangs and mafias and so on for help. And so actually violence increases. But what happens is the violence increases. It helps those same politicians who are running on law and order to get elected because the middle class, the mainstream, is scared. They see more violence. They say, who's going to help me? With the it's that guy who's saying, it's almost always a guy, it's that person who's saying they're going to protect me by allowing the police more latitude and making locking more criminals up. And so what you get is this very vicious cycle where the very people who are fomenting the violence and creating the conditions in which it can grow can also win political power over and over on that platform. And the politicians who are saying, actually let's let's control our police let's have them be less violent so people trust them more so people turn in the very violent people in all societies very few people are violent and if you catch that small percentage of people you have a lot less violence if you focus on a lot of people you have a lot more violence because most people aren't all that violent so the the politicians offering that look soft they look weak they look not tough on crime so they lose and as the violence grows they lose even more so what you really need is, it, that's why the social movement comes into play. You have to tell people somehow that what looks like the easy solution is actually making the problem worse. And what all the research shows is that going after the small number of criminals, not um, excluding people, but bringing people into your society and making them a part of your society, things like that are what keep violence down. And it can be done. It's been done in Georgia and Sicily and, and uh uh, Colombia and so on, um, but it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Kleinfeld, let's end on that note. I wish we had more time to explore these topics a little bit more because the conversation was really interesting. And I, by the way, I really loved the book and I recommend it to all my listeners and viewers. Uh, before we go, would you just like to make reference to some places on the internet where people can learn a little bit more about your work? Um, they can go to my website, rachelkleinfeld.com. Um, they can go to my Carnegie website. So that's the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and just look up my name. I think if they Google a savage order, it sends people to my website or a savageorder.com goes there. So those are probably the best places to go. Okay, great. So I will be leaving all of that in the description box of the interview. And okay. Dr. Kleinfeld, again, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show and to talk to you. And thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricardo.
Hi everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, you also have the alternatives of Subscribestar or PayPal. And please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Kondriano, Yane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Illy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Dr. Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, and Bo Weingart, and my three producers, Cesar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.